the In Conversation podcast series, with author, Nigel Beckles. Welcome to the podcast. podcast. Please like the podcast, podcast. and subscribe podcast. to this channel. Podcast. Thank you. Have you experienced several failed relationships or been through a divorce? How can you avoid making the same mistakes again? How to avoid making the big relationship mistakes is out now. Hi, my name is Nigel Beckles. My new book is packed with practical and common sense strategies that you can use to make better relationship choices. Now you can discover the dangerous myths about love. If your relationship expectations are realistic, why you could be falling in love for all the wrong reasons. How to avoid making the big relationship mistakes. It's a book that could change your life. Available from Amazon.co.uk. Kindle version also available. When the Mood is Right, A Poetry Journey and Mood Swings by Queen P. Available on Amazon and all good bookstores. The Royal Affair by Queen P. Dim the lights, sit back, relax, and breathe. You have entered into the Royal Affair. Queen P. Poetry Podcasts. Available now, 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 now. The Royal now. Affair. The very best way to promote your podcasts, Podpage makes it easy to create a podcast website with just a few clicks. Every page is optimized to be found on Google and it stays up to date forever. For more information visit podpage.com, the future of podcast promotion. Get ready for takeoff. Welcome back to my In Conversation podcast series. My guest for this episode discusses the George Floyd murder trial. Veteran American journalist, Barrington Salmon. Hi, Barrington. Welcome back to my podcast series. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Well, we last spoke last year. Yes. And we discussed the COVID pandemic and the impact on America. How have things yeah. been over there? Well, um, the United States still continues to be the epicenter of the, the pandemic in the world. I think last time I checked that close to 30 million people have been infected. 570,000 people have died. And um, But with the Biden administration, they are doing like 3 million vaccinations a day. They've ramped up production. They use something in the United States that they call the Defense Production Act, where the government basically re requisitions companies and facilities and tools to ramp up production. So the government's working with Pfizer and Johnson and Johnson and th these other producers, and they're, they're producing millions of doses that they're sending around the country. I think the last number I heard was that like 30% of all Americans have had at least one dose, one shot. So um, it's still a struggle. The government's trying to convince everybody. President Biden just said uh, yesterday, I think, that anybody of any age can can start getting it by the end of getting shots by the end of this month. But it's it has become a very political thing because a lot of evangelical Christians who support the Republican Party and Republican lawmakers and such a number of them are refusing to take the shots. And so if the situation occurs where they're not able to fully control the spread of coronavirus, it's going to be because of things like that. Do you think that taking the vaccination will become compulsory, the United States? I think so, because I'm already talking to folks who are telling me that their bosses are telling them no pressure. But if you don't take the shot, you can't come back to work. How is that no pressure? Most people need their jobs. They need to live. Then they have something that they're calling COVID passports. If you want to travel and certain types of movement that you want to do, you need to have taken the shots in order to get notification that you've taken it and it gives you extra access, I guess. Yeah, they're talking about that in the UK as well. You're a yeah. veteran journalist. Yes, How sir. long have you been involved in your field of work? At first paying journalism job was in the summer of 1984. So I've been doing this for about 36 years, written for maybe like 15 newspapers in the United States, U.S. Virgin Islands and elsewhere, and um, freelanced for about 10 years. And since 2019, I'm an investigative reporter for Sputnik News, but I continue to freelance for a bunch of other newspapers like Final Call, Black Press USA, and other publications, Trice, Eddie Newswire, and that type of thing. Well, you certainly have a very distinguished track record. Thank you. Thank you. 
I actually invited <laughs> you on to discuss George Floyd. The yes. brief background to the case is that Floyd allegedly tried to use a counterfeit bill. And the yeah. Were what mm-hmm. are your views regarding what happened? You know, from the time that I saw the video, I've been calling it murder. He posed no threat. Four police officers, three on his on his back and Chauvin on his neck and his back. They killed him. And it's so interesting because I've been watching major sections of the trial over the past two weeks and police officers, the police chief, forensic um, scientists and other other medical people to a person has said that it was unnecessary what Chauvin did and that he killed. Because, I mean, nine minutes and 29 seconds, Chauvin on George Floyd's neck and um, this, this doctor, this pulmonary surgeon, Dr. Tobin, he said um, this week that Chauvin had his knee on George Floyd's neck for three, more than three minutes after he had already t- taken his last breath. But, you know, what we're dealing with in this country, which is probably pretty much what you all are dealing with, Black people are dealing with in England, is that they keep on telling you not to believe your lying eyes. Mm-hmm. Because even though everybody has seen what happened to George Floyd in the video, his defense a defense counsel continues to try to convince the jury that Chauvin wasn't responsible, that putting a knee in someone's neck for nine minutes was not the reason why he died. They're saying he died because he had a heart condition. He died because he he supposedly took fentanyl and methamphetamines. And they said he had other physical ailments that were the real reason why he died. The sad thing is, is that all the defense has to do is to convince one of the jury that there's more, there's less than reason, reasonable proof, he'll get off. If someone is deprived of oxygen for over three minutes, brain damage and then death is likely yes. to occur. So I understand the defence has a job to do, but logic should tell any reasonable person that if you deprive someone of oxygen for over nine minutes, they're going to die. And there's a callousness and a ruthlessness in the way that... um that Chauvin did it because for most of the time that he that he had his knee on George Floyd's neck, he had his hands in his pocket. And his sunglasses with, on his head. And his sunglasses on his head. And yet Eric Nelson, his his lead attorney, is trying to convince people that the crowd was so unruly and they were concerned about the crowd and the da 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 you know, so that's making people angry. But that I understand that that is what they need to do. Well, police brutality, especially in the U.S. against people of color, is nothing new. So why do you think George Floyd's death sparked worldwide protest? It's funny because I've been telling people for even before 2020 that because of all of the things that were happening with the the anger, the rancor, the arguments and, and things with Donald Trump, Donald Trump has destroyed families, blown up relationships, friends, people that were friends aren't friends anymore. Folks and families don't talk anymore. And for me, that was just a precursor to what happened with George Floyd. So I believe that we're in a time when the universe is just basically showing us everything. All of these lies, all of these half-truths, all of these distortions about what America is and what America represents. Everything's been exposed. COVID exposed the social inequities, the the disparities between black people and white people, between white people and other folks. And the the biggest reason that most people say that the reaction that we saw, the global, the nationwide and global demonstrations and protests and stuff is because most people were under the lockdown. Most people were home. Most of the country was watching television and they saw what happened and the reaction. And, you know, I think that there are other elements that we can't even factor in because I've ne- I've been in this country for 40 years and I've never seen as multi-ethnic and multicultural protests. There were as many white people and sometimes more white people that were protesting than anybody else. That's new. So I'm hoping it represents a new awareness, a new consciousness. But, you know, as we already know, it could easily be a moment or a movement. And it's still not clear if there are going to be long lasting and substantive changes in terms of equity, in terms of access, in terms of equality, in terms of how blacks and whites and others are treated. So that still remains to be seen. You mentioned the word movement. What mm-hmm. do you think of the role played by the Black Lives Matter movement since the death of George Floyd? I would go back beyond George Floyd. 
because I remember all of the um, the demonstrations and protests and the different events that were around Trayvon Martin's murder in 2012, in 2013, when his murderer was acquitted. Black Lives Matter basically laid the foundation for this country to confront its racist past. Because America has never come to terms with black people in this country, has never come to terms, even acknowledged the 400 years of slavery, the 400 years of free labor, 400 years of discrimination, Jim Crow, lynchings, murders, rapes, all these things that people inflicted on Africans in this country. And they are still, it is stunning sometimes to hear folks say, well, it wasn't me that did it. I never had no slaves. So why should I give? Why should I care? Why should I, you know, reparations continues to be a very divisive topic because certain folks are saying slavery is ended that, you know, they love to say that if a black person isn't doing well, it's because they're lazy and or irresponsible, not because of the system. When in actuality, we are dealing with institutions and structures that are put in place to ensure that most black people don't have access to the power, the privilege, and the education, the types of jobs. It's like a hydra, Bridget. When you think about the idea that if a Black person wanted to go into certain communities, they couldn't go because restrictive covenants said Black people couldn't buy a house there, or the banks redlined and said, we're not going to put any white people in these communities. We're going to have a certain section for Black people. Lower value, higher property taxes. You go to the bank, you end up paying if you get a loan, your interest is automatically higher. It is so insidious. And so the so-called conversation has started again and is ongoing. But there is very deep reluctance by the mainstream to acknowledge anything. And the thing is, is that, as I think you know, most of these guys understand that if you apologize, that means reparations is coming next. So they're not willing to apologize because they don't want the responsibility of then having to deal with, well, how much are we going to pay them? There's a guy named Dr. Thomas Kramer. I think he's at the University of Indiana. He's estimated that with loss of income, loss of property, and all of the negative impacts of Africans being enslaved in this country, that they owe between 14 and $15 trillion. That's a lot of money. That's a whole lot of money. But you mentioned Jim Crow, and I am a very keen researcher of Black history, particularly mm. in America. And Black people only really got the vote properly in the States in 1965. And now, since the election of Biden, you have the Republicans pushing for voter suppression. Yeah, they have a whole national campaign. 26 states are controlled by Republicans. And in most of those cases, the reasons why they have those majorities is because of gerrymandering, where they've redrawn lines to, to benefit them and to, to, to hurt Democrats. So there are currently 351 voter suppression laws that have either been proposed, introduced, or considered. Two states, I think between two and five states, have passed at least one. One of the houses in between one and five states have passed a bill. And, it's you know, so, of course, the House passes a bill. The Senate passes a companion bill. They have reconciliation, and then it's sent to the governor for signature or veto. But this is just Senator Raphael Warnock from Georgia. President Biden and a number of other people are calling it calling this Jim Crow on steroids. And the epicenter at the moment for this whole effort is Georgia. The Republican majority formed what they call an election integrity commission. And they just passed a whole, they just introduced a whole bunch of bills. The House passed it, the Senate passed it, and it became, it was SB 202. And before the ink was dry, Brian Kemp, the governor, signed it. So that's the first state to sign those laws. And there's been pushback because activists have been pressuring corporations for the bill was passed for them to say something. And most of them didn't say anything because they're not really interested in equity, in equality. They're only thinking about their bottom line. And I saw some numbers and one of these groups, uh, the New Georgia Project, I think they said that um, $7.4 million of corporate money was given to the people in Georgia who passed those bills. And so now all of these corporations are on the hook 
because folks are, are saying to them, you can't stand on the fence. You need to decide what side you are. And so a lot of them are being forced to say whether they agree with the bills that have passed or are going through these legislatures or they don't. They're in a tough place because they've been funding these lawmakers, but they also understand that Black people, Latinos, Asians, and so-called people of color are going to be the majority in 2030, 2040. Mm -hmm. So it benefits the bottom line that they don't offend the people that have buy their goods. So it's been interesting to watch. I've been thinking about the parallels between George Floyd and Rodney King. And as you know, back in 1991, Rodney King was attacked by police after a traffic stop. And that was also captured on video. I have to say, videos back in 1991 were not that common. Certainly not as now where we've got them all on our phones. Well, as I recall, King's injuries included skull fractures, um, broken bones, broken teeth, and sadly permanent brain damage. Now, there were four officers charged with use Mm -hmm. of excessive force, and they were found not guilty. That resulted in the 1992 Los Angeles riots during May of 1992. They moved the trial from Los Angeles to Simi Valley a conservative white community in Northern California. And that's the primary reason why they got off, because they figured that if they had the case in Los Angeles, they would have had a number of black people and non-white people. And they feared that if that happened, that they, the cops would have been convicted. If Chauvin is found not guilty, do you think there will be civil unrest and riots again? I don't know about the riots per se, but I think that stuff going to burn because people are frustrated. I wrote a story last week and there's a criminal justice researcher and professor named Philip Stinson. His research shows that of 143, 153 cases of cops killing black people, only seven were convicted over the past 20 years. So it's very likely that um, he's going to get off. If the past is any indication, he's going to get off. And for me, it was real interesting that as soon as they announced that the case was going to be at that, the county courthouse downtown, they boarded up, they boarded up the, all of downtown. Makes me think that they're expecting that he gonna get out. And mm-hmm. if he does, they're trying to protect their businesses and government buildings from getting burned. Well, you mentioned if he gets off. Mm-hmm. Now, during March of this year, the city of Minneapolis agreed to pay $27 million to George Floyd's family to settle a wrongful death lawsuit. Do yeah. you think that will be a factor in the deliberations of the jury? Yeah, for sure. Why? The 27 million is the second highest settlement award in, in American history, only beaten by the 38 million that the city of Baltimore, Baltimore County paid to Corrine Gaines, this young black woman, black woman who police kicked down her door, shot and killed her, shot and injured her baby. They got 38 million. When, when the George Floyd award was announced, his lawyer asked for an immediate change of venue because he said that it would prejudice the jury and his client couldn't get a, a fair trial. So I think it's going to have, I think it's going to have an impact and it's going to influence the turnout. But my thing is that what I was watching when they were picking the jurors and a Hispanic man told one of the lawyers that he believes that if George Floyd had listened to the cops, he wouldn't be dead. And all they need is one person of the jury to decide that it's not beyond reasonable doubt and it's going to be a mistrial. The onus of all of this is on the prosecution. And all the defense has to do is is to introduce enough reasonable doubt, which is why you're seeing them talk about George Floyd was, he took fentanyl. And it's interesting because he died, he was murdered in May. They claim that they found fentanyl pills in his car in January, this January. So they've been trying to introduce the idea that he had taken fentanyl and methamphetamines just before, before his encounter with the cops. Everybody, all of the police officers, the police chief, the medical personnel have all said that it's garbage, that fentanyl and methamphetamines and the fact that he had heart problems, none of them contributed to his death. The reason was someone putting their knee on his neck for nine minutes and 29 seconds. While you've explored Chauvin's defense team's tactics, how do you believe the prosecution is performing in this case so far? I think it's been, I would almost say masterful because I've listened to legal experts say that the way that they've introduced the people that they've brought in is very different from how it's usually done. I don't know because I'm not a legal eagle, but that's what you're saying. But the preponderance of the testimonies have made it very clear, including the video, that this man killed George Floyd. I mean, it's clear. I mean, as Americans like to say here, even Stevie Wonder could see that. 
But given the, the latitude that police officers get in this country, given the fact that most people, most jurors believe that they tell, that they always tell the truth and they're more willing to believe someone in law enforcement than a George Floyd. And given the narratives and tropes that have been a part of American culture and society for the 400 years that black people have been here, the defense lawyers are painting George Floyd as a criminal, as a, a drug addict. And it's interesting too, because during the first week, the lawyer said that they were afraid of him because he was such a big man. Because apparently he was like maybe six three, six four, and I don't know how tall Chauvin is. Most times that cops get off for killing black people, all they got to say is that they feared for their life. And that's usually enough for them to get off. And so they use that for a minute just to kind of throw it out there, but they haven't really pursued it since then. But was there not a case where a black man was running away from a police officer and the yeah. police officer shot him in the back? He got 20 years. He got tried in South Carolina. He got tried. There were also federal charges against him. He got 20 years. And the person that he shot, his name was Walter Scott. And he got shot eight times in the back. And then the cop threw his taser beside him and then told him that he fought with him for the taser. He was unaware that a young man was watching and filmed what happened. And so I interviewed a lawyer on Thursday. And he said that he was talking to his friend the other day. And he said, Suppose we didn't have video of George Floyd. If we didn't have video of George Floyd, it would be the cop's word against the, the eyewitnesses. And the narrative would have been that Floyd was some threat. He had to get killed and nothing would have happened. And my question is, what about all these other people that they've killed? There was no video. The hundreds of primarily unarmed black men, women and children in this country that they've killed pales in comparison to the true number of people that they've killed and we don't know because they might have been an eyewitness or they intimidated the eyewitnesses not to talk or there was no video. So, yeah. Well, how they've been describing George Floyd is a pattern, as I see it, because mm -hmm. often what they will do, they will murder your body, then they will murder your character. Yes, they murder you twice. That is the pattern. So, Barrington, how can people contact you? I can be reached at barringtonsalmonwrites.com <laughs> or dc at yahoo.com. I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, and so... <laughs> Arrington in Washington, D.C., USA. Thank you very much for your time. Much appreciated. Thank you, sir. Take care. Thanks for having me. Please follow author Nigel Beckles' podcasts on Anchor, Amazon Audible, Spotify, and all major podcasting platforms. Thanks. Thanks.